Good morning, everyone. My name is Sophie Neat, Country Communications Manager for ABB and New Zealand, and I will be your host for this webinar this morning. Please be advised before we start that this webinar is being recorded for future use. I would like to introduce you to Wim Eschlott, ABB's Global E-Mobility Lead and who is our presenter for the webinar today. Wim has been ABB's E-Mobility Lead for the overseas and emerging markets since January 2017. Wim has spent 20 years of his career in various roles in the oil and gas industry in the USA, Asia and Europe. After 20 years in the industry, he decided to make a change to contribute to the energy transition and the change in global mobility. Together with e-mobility service providers, fleet operators and vehicle OEMs, WIM introduced the first end-to-end -end charging solutions for electric vehicles in the APAC region. Recent key successes in the APAC region are the partnership with the Porsche dealers in Asia Pacific, the North-South Charging Corridor for Shell in Malaysia, and the Charging Network with PEA in Thailand and SP Group in Singapore. So without further ado, we welcome Wim. I just want to point out before I pass it over to him, during the webinar and for the Q&A session, to ask a question, please type your question into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. Please be aware that questions will only be visible to myself and Wim. Wim will then address these questions in the Q&A session. You will now see on the screen the agenda for today. We have a lot of exciting topics to take you through, so without further ado, I will hand you over to Wim. Sophie, thank you very much for the introduction and good morning to New Zealand. And I know that there's some fellow Europeans also joining, so good evening to you all. Um, agenda for today is I'll be taking you through some, uh, some of the safety and compliance uh, considerations to make uh, with regards to e-mobility. I'll take you a little bit through the history and the timeline of, uh, of e-mobility, where, where it all started <clears throat> and where we are heading to uh, tomorrow, but also the day after tomorrow. A little bit on the uh, difference between AC charging and DC charging for the newbies on, uh, on the call. Uh, and then we go into more uh, advanced uh, introduction of some products, as well as the, uh, the load management capabilities, energy management capabilities that we offer uh, in the uh, digital environment around the uh, hardware that we supply. So thank you very much for uh, allowing me to talk to you for the next 45 minutes, and then we have a 15 minutes Q&A session as well after that. Before we start with uh, talking about charging infrastructure, electric vehicles, let's please realize um, uh, uh, the business that we're in. Um, we have to realize that 30% of the greenhouse emission gases are currently being generated by traditional um, uh, vehicles on the road. So as ABB, uh, but also you uh, as audience, can play a tremendous role in the uh, mobility transition, in the energy th transition, and really contribute to a more sustainable future. For us, but also important for our children as well. As ABB, we do so. We do supply, uh, we do support uh, the market with, uh, with reducing these greenhouse gas uh, emissions by supplying them with uh, various solutions for the charging of electric vehicles. And as, oh, I, need, I shouldn't be pressing my buttons, but the screen here. As ABB, uh, we are the, the global work leader, uh, world leader when it comes down to EV charging. With the revenues of a bit more than 300 million in 2021, uh, we, we have an annual growth rate of 61%. We are currently at the top of, um, at the, top of the, uh, the market. We have installed more than 650 AC chargers around the globe and 40,000 DC fast chargers. That's installed around the globe, and that means we've installed this in more than 85 countries. And you have to know that in these 85 countries, we only allow ABB products to be supplied if the countries do meet the license to operate, and that is that they have a service organization to support all the technology that's installed in these countries. Companies. More, uh, has more than a, more than a thousand employees uh, currently working for ABB e-mobility and a third more than 350 of them 
are working on the in the R and D environment uh, that we have. So that also I think stresses and underlines a little bit on how fast evolving this market is and the investment that we are making to keep up with the fast technology developments that are taking place in this market. If we look at the, um, the global install base that we have, is that we are being recognized by the global uh, uh, leaders in e-mobility, whether that is charge point operators, utilities, or car OEMs. We are the preferred uh, charging supplier to all these customers around the globe whether that is in the Americas, Europe, Middle East, Africa, Asia, or Australia, New Zealand. We are there to, su to support the various uh, um, customers in these regions. So we also have our install base in New Zealand. Let's look a little bit on how we got this far and how we got here. So for that, I would like to look a little bit over my shoulder and look back to, uh, to the year of around 2010, a little bit before 2010, when uh, ABB e-mobility did not even exist, but there was already a startup in the Netherlands who was, uh, who was able to charge vehicles without any standard being in place. Um, so we, 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 had a, we had a connector and we had a vehicle with a socket and we plugged in and we were able to charge the battery in, uh, in, a, um, in, in, in a pioneering taxi company in the Netherlands. That was almost simultaneous with the, with the moment that the Japanese car manufacturers started to bring their vehicles to the market. And when the Shalomo standard, the Japanese standard for uh, charging of electric uh, vehicles was being developed. Soon after that, the company that all started this was acquired by ABB and that was actually the, the, the founding of ABB e-mobility. ABB e-mobility then started to work together closely together with all the car OEMs to develop, uh, to, to, work together with the car OEMs in Europe, as well as in the United States, to work on another charging standard, which was uh, taking the existing uh, standards a little bit further when it comes down to practicality, uh, power, and future readiness. That is now the commonly known CCS uh, charging standard. That was also the beginning when we started to roll out the first charging networks around the globe. Uh, these days, it was in, um, in Estonia, in Denmark, and in the Netherlands, where we really rolled out major networks in these countries to support the uptake of e-mobility in these countries. We kept on working closely together with the, uh, with the vehicle OEMs, um, but that evolved then into working together with the uh, bus OEMs and to develop the charging standards for charging of electric buses. So together with the uh, bus OEMs who were also using a connector-based charging with CCS. We developed a standard for automated connection devices, the pantograph, and we developed the upcharge um, standard. Soon after that, we brought the CCS standard to the next level. We did that together with the car OEMs in Europe, where we were extremely proud of being able to charge a vehicle with 50 kilowatts back in 2010. In 2018, we were challenged by the European car manufacturers to develop the technology that could support the charging of uh, passenger cars up to a capacity of 175 and even a 355, uh, sorry, 350 kilowatts. We did that and we launched this technology back in 2018. And for that, we developed a charger that contained liquid cooling at that moment. Uh, at that mo uh, uh, soon after that, we also uh, acquired a company in, uh, in China that is currently our uh, production base, our home base for the AC charging portfolio that we have. In addition to that, we developed together with a French utility, a charger, a DC charger that was also to that, that is able to support vehicle to grid. So we are currently rolling this out with the utility in, uh, in France, where we are supplying DC fast chargers for home charging, where then the uh, utility is able to trade back the energy uh, to the grid. So this was all very much hardware based. And we do realize that if we want to further develop the technology uh, for, uh, for, the, for the charging of electric vehicles, that we should also take a closer look at the digital environment of the hardware as well. Because so far it was really about, I can say a muscle game 
who, um, who can charge the fastest by when. Uh, and we've always been contributing to that, and that is where our focus was. But back in 2020, back in 2021, we also started to look at more um, uh, the further development of the digital environment of uh, the charging of electric vehicles. And that's where we started an, uh, an, an, a fleet management company uh, that's currently based in, uh, in, in Germany, in Berlin, which operates under the name of Panion and who is taking care of the fleet management and the energy management of fleets that are in operation. Uh, and with fleets, then you should think about public transport, but as well uh, think about logistic fleets. In addition to that, we also uh, acquired the company Enervalis, who is supporting us with the smart energy control, not for fleets, but more in uh, destination charging environments, households. So to support us with uh, the, the, um, the integration of uh, solar, uh, electrical uh, appliances in your household, your car, and the charger, of course. They are basically supporting us with making our car a, a battery pack to give back the energy from the vehicle into our households. But then back to the hardware that we developed, we launched that, uh, the charger back in, uh, back in 2021, in the end of 2021. It will be released in New Zealand in the coming weeks. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the Terra 360, which is currently the world's fastest charger that can charge at a 360 kilowatt and can smartly dynamically distribute this over four outlets in the charger. That also has an industrial variant, which is the HVC, the heavy vehicle charger 360, which is a power cabinet that can charge heavy vehicles with 360 kilowatts. So this is a little bit on what happened today uh, and what happened in the past. If I now look at what's happening tomorrow, is that we are currently at the stage where we are developing megawatt charging to, to charge trucks while they are on their route, route to top up the, uh, the energy in the batteries uh, with one megawatt or even more. So as ABB, we've always been a big contributor to the development of the standards and we closely work together with the, uh, with the vehicle manufacturers to make sure that there is interoperability between the vehicles and the charging infrastructure. Just taking a close look, a closer look at the, uh, the charges uh, and the charging standards that we've been involved in, uh, in developing. So, so uh, as I already mentioned, we've developed a CCS standard together with the car industry for both passenger cars as well as for heavy vehicles. Uh, and we are actually the first company who've been able uh, to secure a Sharin certificate for CCS charging back in September 2021. We work together with the Open Charge Alliance to develop OCPP to connect your charges to your back office for any B2, uh, B2C or B2B activities that you want to run from your platform with your customer base. And in addition to that, we work together with the bus OEMs to develop an open charger for automated uh, connection devices. The Pentagraph initially started with Pentagraph down, but now also supported with uh, Pentagraph up. So just wanted to stress once more with this slide that ABB is a great contributor to these standards that are developed around the charging of electric vehicles. So, but that is all a complex environment. Eh? If we look at all the standards that are currently existing, which you see in the middle, the, the standards that exist for the charging of electric vehicles. And on, on, on one end of the communication, we have uh, the charging infrastructure. And on the other side, we have the vehicle. The vehicle, which is having a, um, a vehicle controller uh, inside the vehicle, as well as a battery management system, all being managed through the VCCU, which is, so to say, the communication controller with the, uh, with the, charging, uh, with the charging infrastructure. Now, all these standards do exist, and all the car OEMs are following the standards. So I'm not going to challenge that. And so do all the charging manufacturers. We all follow these standards. The reality, however, is that both parties can, can make an interpretation of these standards with slight differences. And these slight differences may cause the, uh, the charging infrastructure and the vehicles not to be compatible. 
So that is why we are always supportive in uh, in the market to work together with the uh, passenger car OEMs or with the heavy, heavy vehicle OEMs to support them to make their vehicles interoperable with our uh, charging infrastructure. So that is on the standards, but besides of these standards on charging and communication between uh, the vehicle and the charging infrastructure, there's also a long list of, uh, of standards that do support us with creating a safe environment, because we shouldn't underestimate uh, the fact that we are connecting a, a high current cable to a high voltage uh, uh, battery, and that we are trying to charge that. So safety is extremely, extremely important. And to secure that, there's various uh, standards that do exist and that should be followed by, um, by both the charging infrastructure manufacturer as well as the car manufacturer. On this list, you see the uh, EMC uh, standards to be followed. You see the uh, low voltage directive for safe operation of low voltage, low voltage electrical equipment. And you see the charging standard that should be followed. Most of these charges are being, um, uh, being controlled and being um, uh, certified with a CE certification. As ABB, we only accept uh, third party certification of uh, according to CE. That means that we have a third party checking for us, assessing for us, certifying us, if we do meet these standards that you see on the, uh, on the slide right here. And for you, important to know that for CE certification, it's not required to have third party certification. Only when things go wrong, when there are safety incidents, then the suppliers of the technology need to prove that they were actually really meeting these standards. We want to be proactive here and we want to prove in advance that we are meeting these standards. And that's why we have a third party uh, verifying our equipment uh, with regards to these standards. And then you ask yourself, is it important that this is done? And I just, I just Googled around a little bit as a preparation for this meeting, and I found a few pictures that uh, I think they tell a, a thousand words. Eh? So we have charges that, um, that have uh, exploded, charges that have been shut down um, because of safety incidents that happened with same charges installed uh, on other places. Um, we do have warning stickers on some charges that these charges do not meet EMC requirements. That means that if you have any electrical device that is sensitive for magnetic radiation, uh, a pacemaker, that that may actually affect uh, the, uh, the electrical device that you are using or that you're actually having um, as, as a pacemaker in your body. Um, and then, of course, we do see the, uh, the fires that happen. These are two, uh, uh, two pictures of uh, situations in, uh, in Asia where uh, the uh, charging uh, actually caused a fire to happen in the vehicles that were being charged. Just a slide to stress for you the importance of safety, CE certification, and third party involvement in that certification for the um, certification of the uh, technology that you are using on both the charger as well as on the vehicle side. So far, and so much about um, standards for uh, interoperability and standards for safety. Now let me quickly touch on the products that do exist and the various use cases that do exist. First of all, for the ones that are new into the field of e-mobility, uh, the difference between AC charging and DC charging. An AC charger is uh, actually a smart socket in your house or uh, at any other destination that you install this. And uh, it is feeding the vehicle uh, with an uh, AC power, AC current. But you should know, you should know that a battery can only be charged by DC. So that means that the AC that you feed into, uh, into your vehicle needs to be converted from AC to DC. And that onboard charger that you also see on this picture here, that is very often, oh, that's not very often, it does have a limitation of the power that it can convert. And it's very often the bottleneck 
in the charging power at which you can charge your vehicle. So you can have installed a 22 kilowatt AC charger. If your onboard charger, just like my vehicle, is only having a capacity of four kilowatts, you can only charge your car at four kilowatts. So if you then have a vehicle with a 60 kilowatt hour battery, it will take you uh, 15 hours uh, to charge your vehicle. Yeah. So that is AC charging where you are limited by the onboard charger onboard of the vehicle. And uh, depending on the vehicle uh, that you have and depending on uh, the investment you want to make, uh, you, uh, that, that onboard charger is uh, either a limitation or not. With DC charging, we are taking out the onboard charger as being the bottleneck and we directly feed DC into the battery. Not directly, we have the battery management system sitting on top. So that means we do the AC-DC conversion, not in the vehicle, but we do that in the technology that we install at the charging locations. And that means that you can actually go much higher in capacity uh, with the AC-DC conversion that you do than that the onboard charger can ever do. So this is what started with 50 kilowatt back in 2010. And this is what's going to be megawatt, not today, not tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow. So that's a little bit on how you should see that. Onboard charges are limited, what we see in the market, to a maximum of uh, 22 kilowatts, with some exceptions that do high power uh, AC charging. Then it goes up to maximum of 43. Uh, most commonly, the max is uh, 22 kilowatts. Um, and with uh, DC charging, we currently, the uh, standards allow us to go up to 350 kilowatts. So that's the difference between AC charging and DC fast charging or DC charging. Now, what technology to select? And this all depends on the use case that we have. So the technology that's being selected should meet the use case for the charging. So we do have situations where cars are being parked for, for four to 16 hours, and that could be at your house or at your office, and where you do have sufficient time to charge a vehicle. That's where an AC charger and that onboard charger limitation will perfectly do. You have your uh, 15 hours, I have my 15 hours of charging time at my house, and I can charge my vehicle from 0% to 100% in 15 hours. Perfectly fine. If you then move to a use case, to locations where you spend one to three hours at a parking at a um, fast food restaurant, a shopping mall, uh, a car dealership, and where you would like to have, uh, where you spend one to three hours, that is where you would like to have a sufficient top up of your battery energy while you are uh, at that location. If you then have a limitation in your onboard charger, three kilowatts, four kilowatts, you better take a DC charger there to feed that directly into your battery. But that's why you don't need that 350 kilowatt charger because that's complete over design. You don't need that at that location as you're gonna spend one to three hours anyway. So that's where you will be installing then a charger that goes up to 20 kilowatts, not with AC, but then with DC. Then there is commercial locations, locations where you spend 15 to 60 minutes, uh, maybe your grocery store where you do your Saturday morning groceries, at least that's what I used to do, um, and where you then can top up your vehicle um, and uh, while you are doing your groceries and when you come back, it's, uh, it's, uh, you have a 100% state of charge. And that is where a charger will do that can charge at a 50 kilowatt and maybe you even want to go higher in the capacity of, at those locations to allow the cars that can charge faster uh, to charge them faster. And if it then needs to be split and you need to simultaneously charge vehicles, you can do that as well. So you can then install a 180 kilowatt charger to charge really fast. But if that needs to be split in two times 90 kilowatt, that then is also possible. And last but not least, there's of course the highway experience that we have. That's where you want to have the same experience as that you have with, uh, with your traditional ICE vehicle, where you want to arrive, connect, take a short break, a restroom break, a cup of coffee, go back to your vehicle, 
uh, after 15 minutes or so, and then you would like the car to be charged. That is where you really require a faster charging experience, and that is why we have these standards developed to go up to 350 kilowatts. As ABB, we do support all the use cases, and we have the whole portfolio uh, available for you to support you in, uh, in all these uh, use cases. So we do have an AC charger, an AC charger that comes in various power classes and that can be supplied with or without a cable uh, for charging at the destinations where you would like to charge vehicles with AC. In addition to that, we have a 20 kilowatt DC wall box and it has a little brother or sister as well of an 11 kilowatt DC wall box and that 11 kilowatt DC wall box can charge them, uh, can does, does support vehicle to grid currently for the Shadowmo standard. And as soon as the CCS standard will also support vehicle to grid, we will have a DC wall box that can support vehicle to grid with CCS as well. So this is the charger that charges at 20 kilowatt DC and that then can be installed at car dealerships or at any other locations where you would spend one to three hours. It comes with either one cable CCS or, and I know that in New Zealand there's quite uh, a, a, large, uh, a large fleet of vehicles on the, on the road that are imported from Japan. So uh, it also can be supplied with a Shadamo cable as well to charge the Nissan Leafs that are still on the road in, uh, in New Zealand. Then there is the, yeah, our bread and butter, the product that we grew up with. Uh, that is the, um, the, the Terra series that charge from 50 kilowatts um, uh, with a single, uh, single charge up to 180 kilowatts and then from 120 kilowatt to 180 kilowatt, we do support simultaneous charging. It can charge your vehicle in these 15 to 60 minutes that you see uh, on the screen here. If we then go to that highway experience, that's where we have the option of a split system as well as an all-in-one charger. So this high power charging technology was developed as a split system in the, in the very beginning. So that's where we have power cabinets, which you see installed in the back here, the power cabinets that are doing the power conversion from AC to DC. And then we have the uh, dispensers that can be uh, installed at a hundred meter distance of the, uh, of the power cabinets to charge the vehicle. The dispensers then also contain the liquid cooling uh, and, the, and the chiller that are needed to support the liquid cooling in the dispenser. What we have recently introduced to the market is the world's fastest charger uh, as we, uh, the technology has evolved and where in the past we were forced to have a split design and having the power electronics installed in a separate power cabinet. These days the technology is available uh, to, uh, to support a much smaller footprint of this so that we actually can install all this technology in one cabinet. So that's the all-in-one uh, cabinet that we have that can support up to a 360 kilowatt over two or over four cables. And now, uh, Sophie, here we go. If I'm correct, we're going to start the movie uh, right now. And here comes the movie. So this movie takes you in, 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 in less than two minutes, take you through the Terra 360 which is equipped, can be equipped with two chargers that do support air cooling. In, ad in addition to that, we can install an advertisement screen with the charger and the advertisement screen actually opens a whole new business for you. So besides of the charging uh, that you make a business of, you can also then use the charger as an advertisement screen. We can install liquid cooled cables or air cooled cables uh, to support the uh, charging of CCS. And if you would like, you can also install the Shadamo cable. Standard configuration comes with two cables. If you would like four cables to be installed with a cable management system, not to forget, we can support that as well. Cables go up to a maximum of 5.2 meters. Um, and again, are supported with a cable management system. 
customization is possible um, and we are happy to listen to your uh, requests about the uh, customization that you need. The uh, advertisement screen I already explained. Four cars can charge simultaneously and then the power will be distributed in a smart way. And what you've probably not seen in, with the speed that this happened is that we do have some smart LEDs on this charger as well. We charge a vehicle and on the top you see the LED turning white that it's uh, that place is taken. If the second car arrives, you also see the top uh, turning from green to white. That means that both spots are taken. But you've not seen that on this uh, on the LEDs, we also have a on the side, we have a blue LED that is actually indicating the state of charge of your battery in the vehicle. And um, the white light of the LED is then blinking as fast as your car is charging. So the faster your car charges, the faster the LED will be blinking. And from a distance, you can actually see the blue light uh, um, um, following the state of charge of your battery. So if you're having your cup of coffee in a restaurant ne next to the charging station, you can keep your eye on the charger and it will tell you what the state of charge is of your battery and how fast is this charging. Now, quick introduction in this meeting on the, on the new Terra 360, the world's fastest charger. And uh, I know from talking to the team in uh, New Zealand that they will introduce this charger to the market in the coming weeks in, uh, in New Zealand. It's not only being introduced to the market, it's also being installed at the moment. So we are installing this in Norway with the pioneering company in Norway, uh, Evany, uh, but also Shell has committed to install these charges for their European uh, operations. And in fact, I do know that this uh, request goes beyond Europe only at the moment. And for uh, a car OEM, Audi, uh, we are installing this in Japan. Uh, and that's where we are installing it, not with the CCS standard, of course, but that's where we are installing this with the Japanese Shadamo standard. So this was all car charging um, and the, uh, the use cases that we recognize and the products that ABB uh, has in the portfolio to support these use cases. In addition to that, we should also recognize that there, is, uh, that there are heavy vehicles. So I'll start this in production to heavy vehicles with buses. Uh, but in a few minutes, I'll talk about trucks as well and uh, how the portfolio for buses can be used for trucks as well. Also for the charging of buses, there's two use cases. It's the overnight charging where, char where buses uh, are charged in a period of two to eight hours overnight. And there's the use case where you want to charge your bus if it's having a smaller battery capacity or for other reasons, if you want to charge it while it is on duty and top up the battery while it is on duty and you only want to charge in five to 15 minutes with extremely high power, that we then call opportunity charging. Overnight charging in most cases is done with connectors. can also be done, we do see use cases now in, in the Americas where we do see pantographs also being used for overnight charging but we do see the market moving toward connector-based charging for overnight charging. And if I then zoom in to the portfolio for overnight charging, um, we, do see, we do see the uh, various capacities that we currently support. So uh, there's the, uh, the DC wall box that we can put on a mobile cart that then can be used in workshop environments so that you do not bring, need to bring the vehicle to the charger that can be quite difficult in workshop environment, but you can bring the charger actually to the vehicle. Um, and then you see a few of the charges that you've seen for, for the charging of uh, passenger cars as well. So that's the 50 kilowatt charger that we have available, but that is then a high voltage configuration to be a, to allow uh, the uh, charger to charge batteries that go above 500 volts. Then we have the portfolio of the 90 kilowatt, the 120 and the 180, which we can supply with a single gun or with two guns. Two guns to support simultaneous charging. And these charges have been customized uh, or adjusted to support the use of uh, um, bus charging, fleet charging. 
These charges do have external filters, so that means it's very easy to replace the filters and you do not need to shut down or you do not need a certified electrician to open up the charger. And these charges do have LED um, LEDs to uh, to inform the driver on the state of uh, status of the uh, of the charger, whether that's available, whether it's charging, or whether it's in error. And then we also have the split design, the 107 and 160 kilowatt, which can come with one, two, or three outlets, and that then supports sequential charging. Sequential charging means you feed the full power into a vehicle. And once the state of charge of the vehicle is reached that you want to reach, it will automatically transfer to the next vehicle that is connected. So we do that with power levels of 107 kilowatts and 160 kilowatts. That is actually today's uh, technology. If we then look at the technology that we are currently rolling out to some pilot customers uh, in Europe at the moment, we are uh, actually further developing the power that we can install in these power cabinets. And what you've just seen with the car chargers that are being able to charge at, uh, at 360 kilowatt in a smart and in a dynamic way, that's the same thing we can do with these more <clears throat> industrialized version of that and then use that for fleet operations. So we have heavy vehicle chargers operating at 360 kilowatt and that then can support the uh, various dispensers that we have that can either be a control box, depot box, or the pantograph down or pantograph up. Big difference also with this cabinet is that it fully supports simultaneous charging as well, up to four outlets. So you can distribute the power over four outlets in a smart and in a dynamic way. That means that one outlet can take the full power and if a second car, sorry, one car can take the full power on a single outlet, and if then a second car arrives to the charger, the uh, power that's available can be distributed to the both vehicles in the way that you configure the charger. Quickly looking at the dispensers, uh, because I do not want to hold that from you. So there's various dispensers that are available for these power cabinets. That is either a, a depot box with a single cable, or uh, a depot box with a dual cable, so with two cables. Bear in mind that if you have uh, the, dual, uh, the dual outlet depot box, that you also need to have vehicles that support the charging at both sides of the vehicles. Uh, so if you have a drive through installation and you have two buses arriving, then you practically need to be able to, to, to connect the cable on one end of the uh, bus, as well as on the other end of the bus, which is not so for all buses, but hey, if you are in an early discussion with your vehicle uh, suppliers, you may be able to organize it as such because it will really support you with a more efficient installation. As you can imagine that if you have a dual outlet depot box, that the cost of installation are much more efficient than if you would do that with a single outlet depot box. Then in the middle, you see the control box, which is actually a little bit the same as a depot box but it is designed in such a way that it can easily be mounted on an elevated construction and it's having an extremely long uh, cable. So you can, uh, you can install this on the ceiling of your depot and run the cable down with a cable management system, which could be a reel. Yeah? So three different solutions, the single outlet and the dual outlet depot box that we have available for charging of, uh, of buses as well as the uh, control box that we can install at the ceiling of, uh, of a depot or of a building. And we've been discussing uh, the charging of, uh, of buses now, but I also would like to stress that with the fast uptake of the electrification of logistic fleets, that this also can be used for the charging of trucks. Uh, here you see a, a distribution center where it is very common um, to install the technology. So the power cabinets you see installed far away from uh, the location where the maneuvering of the vehicles is. And what we also want to avoid is to have power cabinets or dispensers being installed next to the vehicle. As uh, if you come, uh, if you would, would, would study the operations at the distribution center, there will be a lot of maneuvering of the vehicles 
And before you know it, uh, the power cabinet or the charger that's installed on the ground next to the vehicle can easily be hit by the truck. So much better to install it uh, in an elevated construction and then run the cable down as you see on this picture. In addition to that, so that's opportunity, sorry, that is overnight charging or maybe it is also opportunity charging while the uh, truck is being loaded or unloaded. In addition to that, we are now also seeing the recharging of, uh, of trucks coming to the market where trucks need to be charged while they are actually on the road. So we need quick recharging uh, along the highways as well. So all the technology that you've just seen can be used for uh, the charging of, uh, of uh, trucks as well. Not just PowerPoints. Um, I'd like to share with you this case where we are supplying this to a truck operator in, uh, in the US. And that is using actually the car charges to charge the vehicles at 175 uh, kilowatt. Could even be done at a 350 kilowatt if the truck uh, allows to do so. We're also doing the same at a distribution center in, um, in uh, Norway, uh, not with an elevated construction as, uh, as I advise you to do on that uh, picture before, but this is with a depot box that we install at the safe location and with the uh, required protection, it just drops off this picture, but at the bottom you see the um, stainless steel construction that holds the, uh, the truck from, uh, from hitting the depot uh, box. So that's what we're currently doing, where, um, and we see a fast evolution of the uh, charging of heavy vehicles, where this all started back in 2018 with the charging of buses. We now see uh, logistic fleets really coming to the market as well, uh, with electrifying uh, the, um, sorry, companies coming to the market now with electrifying their uh, distribution and logistic fleet. And these uh, vehicles need to be charged as well, of course. Here is the technology that uh, supports that. All right. So a lot, of, a lot of charging, a lot of power, a lot of muscles to get these cars and these vehicles moving. Uh, but now how can we do that in a smart way? Uh, because you need to be careful with all the power that is available, that you do not over-design and that you are efficient in the power that you have available and that you make available to these vehicles. So all the charges uh, that we have uh, in our portfolio are connected. And they are connected for various reasons to support you with your operations. Yeah? So you want to monitor and operate your charges, whether that's cars, whether that's buses, or whether it's trucks. Ideally, you would like to make some business out, uh, out of the charging as well. You would like to get paid for the charging sessions. Could well be that things don't go as they should go and that an, uh, a driver does have questions for you. Yeah. And you want to maintain uh, the, uh, the charges at the most efficient uh, cost that exists. And of course, you want to manage the load and the energy that's on site as well. So all various reasons um, for, for having your charger connected. And if you would allow me for another two hours, I can take you through all these, uh, the reasons why your charges should be connected. But today I want to limit myself to discuss uh, just the, uh, the load and the en energy management on site. So, there is already uh, the possibility of uh, doing load management, energy management uh, with the support of OCPP. Uh, OCPP is the protocol that's being used to communicate from your charger to your back office. So that's a cloud-based uh, platform that's being used to communicate the information from the vehicle, the charger back to your, to your office and uh, uh, to your back office. That of course, does have the risk that there is a delay in the communication if any load management should be done over OCPP. Or there is, of course, the risk that the connection to the back office drops and that the uh, OCPP, that the load management over OCPP or through OCPP is, uh, is not available. So that's why we have developed a local site controller, a local site controller that communicates uh, with our charger and it basically works, uh, can work uh, relatively simple to really advanced in a very advanced way. And I want to take you as a final session of this, um, uh, this presentation through the various cases that we recognize that do exist. So if I take you through the evolution 
uh, of uh, of immobility charging, then this is how it all started. You have a charging site and you have a few charges installed, a limited number of charges installed, and the power that's available is no limitation at all. Yeah. This is how it all started five, six years ago, also in New Zealand, which is already a pretty advanced country when it comes down to e-mobility. What we see those days, uh, sorry, what we see today actually, is that we do see the charging sites and the number of charges on the site increasing. So that also means that the power demand on these uh, locations is increasing. And uh, on, uh, fortunately, or unfortunately for the business, but fortunately, this, there's not always a constant and continuous demand of this high power on your site. So why having this high grid connection, while only for 80% of the cases you are using less, and for 20% of the cases you are using the full power uh, from these charges? Now, what we want to what we want to uh, avoid here uh, is that if there's too many charging capacity uh, requested from the uh, from the grid, that the char that that the that the fuse will blow. Yeah. So it's mission critical to be able to charge all the vehicles that you see here. So you don't want the four char the four cars to be charging at full power, and when the fifth car arrives and also demands full power, that the fuse blows. So that we can control with that site controller. The site controller easily assigns a budget to the chargers, and the budget then, of course, is limited to the grid capacity that you have available on the site. The budget can then be simply managed in two ways. It easily allow, or, or it first, the first case, it allows the first vehicle, sorry, uh, first come, first served. So that means that the cars that are connected will get full power. If there's then a car that arrives and the full power is not available anymore, then that fifth car, in this case, that arrives will get what's left. Yeah? Or there is the scenario where there is equal share, and that means four cars are charging at full power. If the fifth car arrives, uh, the power of all the other four vehicles will also drop so that all five cars will get the same power from the charger. So that's what the local site controller does and supports you with the load management on the site in case there's grid restrictions on the site. So you can allow uh, the chargers to charge at full power uh, with a limited number of chargers. If all charges are being used with full power, you put in, a bu you put in the budget and you manage that in a smart way. In addition to that, there can be cases where you would like to, and that's what you can use the local site controller for as well, where you want to put in some peak shaving. Peak shaving to be done by a battery energy storage system uh, or peak shaving to be done with that budget as well, where you allow uh, peak consumption during peak hours and peak charges. The site controller then communicates with the battery energy storage system uh, and the charges as well as with the substation. And it will, uh, it will ask the battery energy storage to kick in when it's needed and it will tell the battery energy storage when it can easily can go to rest to be charged by the substation. And then the, uh, the charges will use the substation and the grid connection only. Now on the site, you can also have additional uh, consumers and additional uh, producers as well of, uh, of electricity. So there can be solar or there can be wind uh, turbines, but there can also be buildings that are using uh, electricity. ABB also supports them with uh, the site energy optimization through an advanced software package uh, that we have. And you can even go one step further, and that is where you would like to include more advanced energy services. You may want to look at the weather forecast, uh, because we all know that our batteries and the behavior of our batteries really vary based upon the temperature outside and the climate that we have. You also would like to have a look at the uh, load profiles of the vehicles and the routes that they take, the schedules of your fleet. And of course, you want to take into account when is a good moment to charge, and maybe, maybe there is a moment where it's actually good not to charge, but to give back energy to the grid. And that's where you then enter the, the domain of energy trading. With, um, with the addition of a few companies uh, to our portfolio, 
uh, and to our company over the last two years, we can also support you with that. We can support home charging and smart energy management uh, in those use cases, as well as energy management and fleet management for fleets. So uh, small uh, installations as well as big fleets that need to be managed in uh, uh, where, the, where the energy and the load need to be managed in a smart way are supported uh, with, uh, uh, with the products and the software that we have. Case where we are using this, just as a closure of the session here, is uh, in Germany, where we have installed this at a bus depot in Hamburg, where we have installed all our technology in the uh, technical penthouse of this depot, which you see constructed on top of the, uh, of the building here. So that's where we have installed all the, uh, the, the transformers and the switch gear that is required, as well as the chargers. And we are running uh, the cables down from the ceiling where we have installed the control boxes. But we have also installed there the energy management system, which really looks at the grid connection that is available, the consumption from the office building that's right next to it, and the charging capacity that is requested from the uh, or by the buses. Uh, just just a zoom in into the situation as I just described, where you do see the technology installed, the uh, transformer, the uh, switch gear, MV as well as LV switch gear, and the charging technology that's installed over there. And that, Sophie, brings me back uh, to you, as this is uh, this my presentation is coming to an end here, and that's where we probably need to open up the floor for some Q and A. Huh? Perfect. Thank you very much, Wim. Um, really great presentation there. Um, a lot that you've gone through in a short amount of time, so I appreciate that. So we have had a lot of questions come in, which is fantastic. So please, please bear with us, those on the line. We have a few hundred people on the line. Um, so I'll get through all the questions as fast as I can. But if we do not address your questions, we will definitely address them offline. Okay, so the first question, Wim, how far off is the megawatt charging standard? Is there a transition from CCS2 to MCS in place? Uh, so the megawatt standard does exist. Uh, it's been recently introduced at an exhibition uh, and a conference in, uh, in Norway. So the standard exists. Now it's up to the technology to be developed according to these standards. Um, very good question on the transfer from CCS uh, to MCS. Yes, that will happen. Uh, so uh, that is what we will see coming to the market first is higher. So currently CCS is limited to 350 kilowatts. We do know and we do see that there's now a discussion going on to release that limitation of 350 kilowatts to be able to support uh, higher power megawatts with CCS and that will then evolve into megawatt charging. Uh, so standard exists, technology is currently being developed, and we will, let me say soon, uh, bring the first projects to the market. Thank you, Wim. Our next question, what marine rated charges does ABB have that are not water-cooled cables? Can you do IP65? Um, what marine, uh, so, we use, uh, we use air cooling for our power electronics. Uh, and that means that we, uh, that we need to have an inlet for air and an outlet for air. And that means that our charges are IP54, like, like most charges commonly on the market that do use this. Uh, and we do install our charges uh, for marine applications. So we are charging uh, ferries and uh, smaller um, uh, boats uh, for, uh, uh, I don't know the English word for that, but we do charge them. Uh, what we have there is the challenge of the, uh, uh, the humid environment, uh, which is being managed inside our char charger by a humidity controller. And we have uh, the salty environment, which so far has gone uh, perfectly fine. So what we've seen is that the IP54 standard perfectly allows uh, charges to be installed in a humid and salt and dusty environment. My gosh, we are installing our charges in Qatar. We have installed uh, 125 megawatt of charges in, uh, in Qatar. Uh, so uh, I don't see any problem uh, with uh, IP54 to be installed for marine or other demanding environments. 
Fantastic. Okay, next question. With the Terra 360 WIM, can the CCS Type 2 plug charge 360 kilowatt? Uh, no, it cannot. Um, because uh, uh, because the uh, CCS standard is limited to 350, so the power class is limited to 350 kilowatts. So we're not allowed to do so uh, on a single cable. As soon as that CCS releases the 350 kilowatt uh, power limitation, we could charge a vehicle at 360 kilowatts. Uh, but hey, with this charger, we are challenging the OEMs to bring a vehicle to the market that does support 360 kilowatt. We are now far above uh, and far uh, beyond what is uh, currently possible uh, in the automotive uh, market. So we have 350 kilowatt as per the standards, uh, and we are uh, we are able to charge 360 kilowatt if the standards do support. Fantastic. Okay, should third-party certification be a government responsibility? What role is there for governments in certification? Um, I don't. I don't. Th I don't think uh, that, that there has to be uh, a role for the government in in the certification itself. There's third parties that are approved of of doing these uh, certification tests. But I think it's a very valid uh, command here, and that that's how I get this question more than than a question by itself. That if there's any public uh, public um, uh, tenders uh, on the market, or if there's going to be any public installations where the uh, government also have has the responsibility uh, for for public safety, so to say, that it it would be good actually if uh, governments or authorities would have the requirement of the technology that's going to be installed in a public space, thus meet third party certification. Absolutely. Great. Okay, can the commercial 50 to 180 kilowatt DC charger charge two to four cars simultaneously? With the, we can charge two cars simultaneously with the 120 kilowatt charger that we have and 180 kilowatt chargers that we have. That means that we split the power either in a 50-50 uh, static way or we split that in a dynamic uh, uh, way. So that means we have a, um, a 90 kilowatt a power blocks, as we would call it, granularity of 90 kilowatts uh, or 60 kilowatts. Uh, so then we can uh, split that with the either, I have to explain it diff differently. We have a granularity there of, uh, of 30 uh, kilowatts. So we can split, we can charge a vehicle uh, now, now you're dra now you're draining my technical knowledge here. So the 120 kilowatt charger can charge at either two times 60 or one times 120. Yeah. The uh, the 180 kilowatt charger can charge 180 kilowatt at a single gun or two times 90 kilowatts uh, simultaneously. I'm a little bit confused here on the 360. The 360 can charge four vehicles at the same time, and that's where we have a granularity of 90 kilowatts. So that means we can do one cable 360, limited by the uh, standard 360. We can do 270, 90. We can do 180, two times 90, et cetera, et cetera. Great, thank you. Um... Uh, okay, next question. Does the vehicle battery degrade faster with more frequent higher powered charging? That's what they say, yeah. Uh, I'm not the battery expert here, uh, so we better ask the, uh, the battery experts. But we do know uh, that um, occasional balancing of the battery uh, with AC uh, is, is, is really healthy for your battery and for a longer life of your battery. Um, we do know that there's some, some heavy vehicle OEMs, some bus OEMs. Buses are frequently and almost in, in all cases being charged with DC only, that they are supporting ba um, balancing of the batteries with DC as well. Um, so it's really a question more for the, for the battery uh, manufacturers than for the charger manufacturers. Um, and that's, I think, is my, my answer. Great. Um, we have reached the end of this webinar time. However, Wim, if you do have time to stay online to answer the remaining questions, because there are a few, I just want to give those that have um, participated to get their questions asked. So if you can spe um, spend 10 more minutes with us, that'd be great. Um, Absolutely. Okay, so next question.
Thank you. Just goes to show that uh, there are a lot of people on the line. They're very interested. It's a very hot topic. Okay, so the next question, Wim. How long do you think uh, KDMO plugs alongside CCS2 will be retained on commercial and highway DCFC? With increasing occurrence of queuing and a failing proportion, sorry, and a falling proportion of KDMO EVs, it seems that CPOs may look to prioritise CCS2 in coming years. No, CCS, CCS is being CCS is being preferred by the car OEMs, but uh, we have to we have to um, so 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 there's there's two there's there's two national standards as I call them. That's the Shadamo standard and there's the GBT standard. Shadamo in Japan and GBT in uh, in China, and then there's the CCS standard for the uh, for the other countries. What we do, uh, what we have seen, however, in the past is that the Japanese car manufacturers were exporting their vehicles to the European market, but also to the, to the New Zealand market. So that's where there's a service demand on the market for Shadamo. So if you are, and I don't know who asked the question, but if you are a charge point operator, and as long as that there is a fleet of uh, Shadamo vehicles uh, on the road, then uh, we, we support you with the technology to charge these vehicles with Shadamo. In the long term, I do see that the car OEMs will supply CCS outside of their home markets. If we look at the Shadamo standard, uh, it will still be the standard for, the, uh, for Japan, and the GBT standard will still be this, the standard for China. Outside, we will see that evolving towards CCS, but yeah, there's still a lot. There's still a big fleet of these pioneering vehicles of the Nissan Leaf on the road. Eh? Don't forget that they were one of the first electric vehicles that were coming to the market together with the IMEF. And yes, they are charged with Shadamo. So as long as they are there, uh, we support you with the technology to charge these vehicles. Great. Great to hear. <clears throat> now, uh, when there's a question asked previously around battery, I've got a similar question. Um, there have been concerns raised that if vehicles use DC charging too often, that the vehicle battery degrades faster. Have you got any data on this? Uh, again, uh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not the battery manufacturer, and I don't have the data. Um, what, what I, what I, let me share. Let me share. Let me share this then on uh, on DC fast charging of vehicles. We've seen some research of, I've, re, I've personally read some, some research projects on taxi fleets uh, that were being continuously charged with DC. Those were Teslas uh, that were charged uh, always with DC, never ever used AC for charging. And uh, the degradation that, we, uh, that, that was reported in that report after a respectable mileage and I'm not even going to say whether that was 200k or 300k or 500k of uh, kilometers, but that the, that the uh, degradation of the battery was still very limited. So it's not as bad as that it would run down drastically. And all the other questions on the batteries, I would like to forward to the uh, battery uh, manufacturers. Yeah, so just moving forward, when any questions that come through around that, um, we'll just uh, we'll just put to the side and address um, offline, or put them in touch with uh, someone that can answer those questions. Um, okay, next question: Any views on pantograph up versus pantograph down implementations? Any view on this? Huh? Well, yeah, well, it's a, it's almost a philosophy on uh, on what uh, what you would like to use. We do uh, we do support both. Uh, we do uh, we do support pantograph up. Um, uh, for cases where there's a combination of overnight charging with a pantograph as well as on route charging. And we do see, well, and again, here is where I'm a bit contradictive with myself. We do see pantograph down, uh, mostly being used where we do see on route uh, charging. Um, if we look, however, at the North American market, um, uh, if we look at Edmonton, that's where we've now installed pantograph down in depot environments. So it's really a philosophy of the uh, of the operator of the buses uh, what what they want. Uh, uh, do they want the pantographs to be installed on the buses, but also all the consequences of that, or do they want to install the pantographs on the infrastructure with all the consequences uh, of that? Uh, and both have their plus and minuses, and it's really upon the operational environment. 
that uh, should uh, that should be known to really uh, support the operators with making the best choice for pantograph up or pantograph down. We we support both and. Um, we like to work together with the operators uh, when they are making their decisions to see how we can support them. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. For a site with limited electrical supply, is there ability to combine with batteries? Um, for sites with limited power, is there uh, the ability to, to use batteries, battery energy storage? Yeah, if, 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 can you repeat the question, Sophie, because that's how I heard it. Yes, absolutely. For a site with limited electrical supply, is the ability com to combine with batteries? Yeah, 100%. So battery energy storage can be used, um, and that needs to be used in a smart way. Then you only would like the battery to kick in when it's required, and you would like the battery to be charged when it's not required. And we do have the site controller who can play an important role there, yeah. Perfect. Great. Thanks for that, Wim. Okay, so next question. Uh, are there airport facilities that ABB charges, oh, sorry, that use ABB charges for car parking, rental cars and public transport, et cetera? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, we use, uh, we, are we, are, we are supplying uh, charges for the, um, uh, for the parkings in uh, on the on, on what we well, and I, it, I, I think this question comes from somebody who's in the uh, in the uh, uh, working in the airport environment, so they will recognize the terminology that I use. We do see we do supply charges for both the land side as well as for the air side of the uh, of the airport. So we do supply uh, the charges for the public parking and uh, for the uh, public transport that's being used on the land side. And we are also also closely working together uh, with vehicle OEMs, the craft vehicles OEMs, as well as the public transport OEMs, so who make the buses on the air side of the uh, airport. So absolutely, yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So we've just got four minutes to go. Just I know we've extended it to over ten minutes. Just that we could be possibly here all day, Wim. Um, so again, just to those on the line, if we don't address your questions, uh, we will definitely come back to them offline. Okay. Okay, so next question, uh, Wim. Does the ceiling charging for trucks need to be under a canopy or are they waterproof? Does what need to be under a canopy? Does the ceiling charging for trucks need to be under a canopy or are they waterproof? Oh, no, they are waterproof. So they can be, so all, all our equipment is designed for outdoor use. So whether it's a power right. cabinet or whether it's a dispenser, it can be installed outdoor. Okay, perfect. Okay, so what is the lifespan of these charges and how is ABB addressing the environmental concerns on the disposal of these charges? Um, um, so the lifespan of the charges, um, they, let me say it like this, because we're, we're only in 2022 now um, and we're leaving 2010, it's not so far, uh, so far beyond, behind us. But all the charges are being um, uh, being designed for a lifetime of 10 to 15 years. Depends a little bit on the use case. So we design them on uh, years as well as on usage. So it's it's either the the lifetime of the uh, of the charger or how frequently it is being used. Um, and we we do uh, we do we do support of course the customers with the sustainable approach uh, to uh, to the decommissioning uh, of the charges, uh, and we do meet uh, and I forgot about the exact uh, ISO classification that does exist for um, uh, for this, but that is what's being met by ABB. Yes. Great. Okay, uh, two more questions, one just before we uh, end this webinar. Uh, what is the largest highway charging station and how many KVA is a substation size? Uh, and how many guns? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so now, now you're asking me about installations that are not in my territory, and I don't like the word territory, but it's just we, we the biggest the biggest charge the biggest charge um, charge point installations that we've delivered for vehicles is uh, most likely uh, in Europe in the UK for a customer, 
um, and the megawatts there. Uh, so, Sophie, if I would not, I would need to come back to this, but this is uh, the, the the grid surf the grid surf installations that we've done in the UK are probably the biggest uh, charge point operating sites for vehicles that we've done. If we look at the uh, installation that we've done in Qatar, in Qatar we have delivered the uh, charging infrastructure for the charging of the electric buses for FIFA 2022 in November. Um, and that is the biggest depot is having 475 buses uh, and they are all being charged with 150 kilowatt. Um, and that's where you need to do the mathematics then, uh, Sophie, uh, 475 times 150 kilowatts. So that is uh, a significant installation that's, uh, that's done over there. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, what, the last question. Uh, do you support software with your AC and DC charges that allow users to, to pay kilowatt via credit card, phone app, and plug and charge? Um, so we do support so the various payment uh, methods that that we have and the authorization that we do. Uh, so we do support OCPP to begin with to connect to a back office. Uh, ABB does have various options for back office as a service as well. Um, so that that's one way of payment. Uh, credit card payment is supported for the DC charges uh, that do allow. Uh, the uh, the uh, the space for a um, uh, for a credit card terminal, so that means that fits in all our DC charges except for the DC wall box. Uh, we do support uh, plug and charge, uh, and then in addition to that, uh, ABB also supports auto charge, which is a which is a technology that's being developed uh, by ABB together with the charge point operator as an open standard. Uh, a bit more lean, a bit more easy to install than plug and charge, but it works uh, on the same basis. You plug in the connector and the connector uh, and the charger recognize which vehicle is being charged and that can, can be connected to the owner and the credit card, etc. Okay, great. Um, so just because of time, um, we'll just close this webinar off now. Um, as I mentioned before, we have a lot of questions still to answer, which we will um, do offline. Um, so don't, um, you know, we will definitely address them. So we will come back to you. Um, so I just want to thank Wim, first and foremost. I know that it is late over in the Netherlands. So thank you very much for presenting and taking your time out uh, to talk to this big crowd because there have been a few hundred on the line um, with a lot of questions coming through. Uh, and also thank you to everyone that asked the questions and participated. Uh, just to point out, uh, tomorrow everyone will receive, or that has been on the line, sorry, everyone will receive a recording of this webinar um, to uh, utilize and share with your colleagues uh, and team members. Um, so again, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day and um, we will definitely host webinars in the future um, around these certain topics. So uh, stand by for future uh, promotion around that. So thank you, Wim. Have a good day, all. Thank you, Sophie. Bye-bye, all.